Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dennis Johnson with Forward Community Investments, and uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. We're excited to have you join us today. Um, we did push out a question here in the chat feature a few minutes ago, which some of you have been responding to, but what does governance mean to you? If you haven't had a chance to do that, feel free to do so. Um, but before we get going, we're going to just walk you through some housekeeping um, issues or some housekeeping items with today's webinar. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity first, though, to share the background of how we got here today. Forward Community Investments has worked with Wisconsin nonprofits for almost 20 years. We build capacity in the nonprofits across the state of Wisconsin through both low-cost loans and expert advisory services. As the most established financial management advisor of its kind in Wisconsin, Forward Community Investments provides its clients with guidance, resources, skills, and capacity building as a means of building a stronger, secure, and more sustainable communities, one nonprofit at a time. Wisconsin nonprofits are faced with many complex problems today. And based on our survey from last fall, nearly 58% of the nonprofits across Wisconsin reported expenses increasing, while only 37% reported revenues increasing. So there's a, a gap there that uh, is growing and is uh, in the last couple of years with our annual survey. It's a fragile financial cycle that's been challenging for many, and making strategic leadership efficient use of finances is ever more important. Well, the good news is that with the support of BMO Harris Bank, Forward Community Investments is offering this series of webinars to augment the Building Financial Sustainability, a virtual leadership series, and to further build nonprofits' effectiveness across the state. A year ago, Harris and m and came together to form BMO Harris Bank, a strong U.S. bank that offers more for their customers and communities it serves. BMO Harris Bank is an active partner in Wisconsin communities and demonstrates strong corporate citizenship as an important part of whom they are and how they approach community. We thank BMO Harris Bank for their support to provide Building Financial Sustainability, a virtual leadership series for Wisconsin's nonprofit community. Before I get into introducing our speaker for today and today's topic, I do want to show you a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, the first one here is you can join the webinar either by using your telephone number provided, or you can also use your computer speakers. So if you can hear me now, you've probably figured that out. But for those of you that maybe can't hear me, hopefully you're reading the screen and you can see that there's two ways to join the audio portion of today's call. Again, both by using the telephone number that is presented on the screen and also your computer speakers if you have the ability to do so. We're also going to be taking some questions today. So if you have questions or you want to chat with us, you've got a comment you want to make that you want to either present with Emily, our, our panelist, um, or to ourselves, or if you're having any audio or technical issues, please feel free to use either the chat feature or use the question box. Again, both of those are in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We also are going to be doing some polling today. We're going to open up our first poll here shortly, but we will be polling participants throughout today's webinar. So please submit your responses using the poll function, which can also be found in that window on the right-hand side of the screen. So today's uh, speaker, Emily Hall is going to be talking around governance and new challenges, new opportunities, and new models. As Olive Grove's founder and CEO, Emily has provided strategic consulting services to thousands of community leaders, social entrepreneurs, nonprofits, board members, corporations, governments, and philanthropists over two decades. She has enhanced the impact of organizations of every size, sector, stage of development, and mission focus, and helped individuals focusing their giving for maximum impact. While Olive Grove provides a full range of consulting services, Emily primarily works with CEOs and boards during points of inflection, growth, opportunity, confusion, or change. She frequently is in highly complex and ambiguous environments. She supports clients in both philanthropy, strategy, governance, succession, transitions and mergers, and other mission-critical topics. Before founding Olive Grove in 2002, Emily served in a number of senior leadership positions, including Executive Vice President and Head of the West Coast Nonprofit Profit Practice for DHR International. She was the Director of the West Coast Nonprofit Practice for A.P. Kearney and a Director at the Management Center. Emily holds a bachelor's from Northwestern University and studied abroad at the University of Sussex in England. She completed coursework for her Master's in Human Resources and Organizational Development at the University of San Francisco. Now, before I turn the call over to Emily, we are going to open up our first poll to find out who's on the line with us today. And so our first poll is really who's with us. And so my colleagues should uh, have that poll going here shortly. 
And the first question is, you know, are you the chief executive of your organization? Are you the board of director? Are you a funder? Do you represent staff or perhaps some other position? So if you could take a few minutes. Um, we have about 80 people on the line today, and I see the responses are coming in. And we actually have, looks like a pretty cross-section of both the chief executives, board members, and staff today with a few funders and a few others. Our second poll is really going to ask you some specifics around the size of your board. And so we're trying to get a sense of kind of the size of the boards that you have in your organization. So is it less than five directors? Is it six to 10? Is it 11 to 15 or 16 to 20? Or perhaps you have a larger board and more than 20 directors. Uh, but this gives us some context for today's um, discussion around what size of the boards that you're working with as well. And so those are two of the context items that we have. And at this point, I'd really like to turn the call over to Emily Hall for today's presentation. Welcome, Emily. Great. Thank you, Dennis. So uh, Dennis, I just want to check that you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see your screen. OK, great. Uh, so welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to talk with you a little bit about governance. And um, as Dennis said, I've been working in the field for 20 years. And I've, I've seen a lot of boards and um, have had a lot of experience with different types of boards, different models. Um, but more importantly, I've really had an opportunity to learn from a lot of my colleagues uh, who work with us here at Olive Grove in our network structure. And so hopefully I can elevate a little bit about what I've learned from them and some of the things that they've seen. Um, my goal is to share a little bit about what I'm seeing, but also to have an opportunity to uh, learn from the people on the webinar. So we've fashioned it such that there will be time for the polls, time for the questions, and make sure that uh, you all have an opportunity to share your own reflections, your own ideas, and um, enrich in the conversation well beyond what I've got to share today. So I'm just going to move through um, a little bit of setting the framework of what we're talking about. And I personally always like to start with kind of the definition of govern. I always go back to my dictionary. Um, always used to be a favorite <laughs> pastime of my family and my first boss. So that tends to be where I start. And uh, probably won't be any surprise to you here um, about the definition that I've come up with uh, from the Oxford Dictionary. But governance is really about conducting policy actions and affairs of an organization. And depending on the definition and the root that you look, like, look at, there are kind of two different frames, which are similar but have a different feeling to them. And one is really around control, directing, regulation, um, you know, very uh, kind of a, a top-down, very uh, oversight role. And another frame is more around steering and what I call stewardship. And I think that those are not necessarily in conflict. I think that governance needs to exert a level of control because, um, here we go, now I see the presentations being kicked over to me, so let's make sure that's working. OK, great. Um, so uh, being able to oversee the board in compliance with your tax exemption on behalf of the communities you serve, on behalf of the mission, but also this role of stewardship, which is really working in partnership with the community, in partnership with the funders, the constituents, the staff, and helping to influence and steer. And I think that sometimes those roles need to move together, and sometimes they're distinct. Uh, but it's kind of two different hats that I think, or frames uh, that board and staff and constituents can think about in terms of the role of governance. So Dennis, I'm not able to see the responses that you might have gotten from uh, your questions. So I wonder if there's anything else from the group that you wanted to elevate there. I would say the one thing there, um, we, we don't have any questions that I can see coming in specifically yet. 
Um, but as it relates to the size of the, the types of uh, the, the size of the boards of directors that we've got, about 36 percent of them were in that six to 10 size bracket, and the other 35 percent were in 11 to 15. And we did have 13 percent of the respondents have really larger boards that are, are larger than 20 directors. Mm. Okay, good. Well, I think we're going to talk a little bit about structures further in, so let's hold on to that and uh, talk about some of the pros and cons we've seen of size. Great. So let me uh, move on to what we call the non-negotiables. Um, we always like to make sure that our clients are aware of the baseline expectations that they have. And they really fall into two buckets. But within each of these sections, there are, of course, of course kind of multiple sub-bullets and topics. And so this is um, not a full legal review of your obligations, but it does kind of paint the picture of what you have to have in place. What are the bare minimums for a board to operate? And the first bucket is really around your tax exemption. Uh, which is different than legal compliance. Uh, this is what you file for the IRS. If you're a C3, it means that most of your revenue will not be taxed. It probably means that you are um, not um, up for property tax. And there are some exceptions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but really, this is a, a tax status as opposed to a legal status. And the IRS, again, has multiple ways of assessing how well you are meeting their standards for tax exemption. And the last slide does show some resources you can go to. But basically, if you go to the IRS tax exempt site, they will walk you through um, in multiple pages and documents what compliance means for them. But it comes down to a few key items. The first thing they look at is what they call duty of care duty of loyalty, and duty of obedience. And you can tell just by the language we're using here that these are um, terms that really are coming out basically of the, the founding of the sector, the founding of philanthropic enterprise um, back in de Tocqueville's time. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you kind of a snapshot of what they mean. A duty of care really means that you are being responsible for the oversight, that reasonable people in a similar situation would come to a similar uh, decision or response. So you're not abdicating responsibilities, you're not ignoring the signs, you're not um, purposely looking the other way. So duty of care is really just paying attention. Duty of loyalty is a lot more about putting the mission ahead of your own self-interest. And this is where things like conflict of interest come in and uh, elements of self-dealing, loans to officers, uh, loans to employees, which all are monitored very closely by the IRS. But it also means in a more nuanced way, if you are on a board understanding that you may be representing the voice of a particular constituency in order to shape and steward that mission, but ultimately, as a voting board member, you are acting in the best interests of that organization overall. That's the, the primary hat you're wearing that um, uh, takes over the, the other representation roles you have. And duty of obedience is really duty to the mission, that that's your guiding principle, that's your tax-exempt uh, tax status and the purpose in the community. And so you're always coming to that as a touchstone to make sure that you're governing in line with that mission that you filed with the IRS. Um, they're also very interested in compliance on a number of other areas. Um, these are just a few of the key ones that tend to come up very regularly. Um, as a C3 organization, they are very interested in knowing how much money you're spending on advocacy and direct lobbying. And um, there's a whole another webinar that might be beneficial um, to this group on what the definitions of lobbying and advocacy are and what those thresholds are. And there are ways to file for um, slightly elevated thresholds, which is something called the H election, um, or to file for a different um, 
segment of the code, for instance, um, going for a C4 status, which allows for much more extensive lobbying and ag advocacy activities, but less tax exemption. Uh, they also are looking at certain standards around funding from the public to make sure you're not pick, tipping into a private foundation or other sorts of um, primary source donors. For most C3s, they want to see a mix of funders. And of course, they want to make sure that you're filing your 990s or some sort of the easy postcard or something to make sure that you are reporting back to them on your activities. There are others, but these are the main ones that boards need to know about. One of the ones that's very important, particularly for large organizations, is the topic of compensation and intermediate sanctions. And if you Google nonprofit compensation IRS, you'll probably get a lot of hits. Um, because particularly in the realms of hospitals, um, large nonprofit cultural centers, uh, other really I'd say probably in the 20, 50, 100 million, 200 million sorts of organizations where the compensations tend to be well north of 100,000 and sometimes a million and more. Uh, they want to make sure that you are paying what they call a reasonable salary. And again, there's a whole set of standards and uh, guidelines around this, but it's certainly something that's a critical um, component for boards of large organizations to understand and it's uh, they're they are coming under increasing scrutiny not only from the IRS but also through the press and sites like Charity Navigator so if you fall into that category make sure your board gets some education on those standards the last one I put up here is not very glamorous but it's what they call the UBIT which is unrelated business income tax and basically that means if you have revenue streams that are not directly linked to your mission. For instance, if you're a museum and you have a shop or you uh, have facilities that you rent out to other organizations, you may trigger something called the UBIT. And so any revenue streams that aren't really clearly linked to your program, it's good for you to get a review. And the reason I brought it up here is because states and federal governments are really looking at UBIT as a way to recapture tax base. Um, so there's been a lot of scrutiny on this, um, a lot of review. It can certainly trigger an audit or a review from the state. So if you do have those um, complementary revenue streams, it's a good idea to get a review of those because it happens to be a very hot topic uh, right now. So I'll uh, go on to the next and then maybe we can take a couple questions if you have any about these. The other um, bucket is legal compliance and this falls into various regional areas. So your local laws, your state laws, your federal laws. Um, one of the biggest is filing for incorporation. So nonprofits are businesses. They file with the Attorney General and they also generally go through a tax exemption um, process with the state. Um, but they fall under corporate law, and depending on what state you're in, it may mean that you have a certain number of minimum board members that you need to meet a certain number of times. You might have certain filing regulations or transparency regulations. So it's really critical that your board understand your attorney general's standards and what you're on the hook for, both legally and in terms of state tax exemption. Um, and sometimes the nuances are a little bit different than the IRS, so don't assume that they're the same. Um, most states now uh, have implemented some sort of fundraising registration or fundraising laws. Um, and so it's typically a pretty novel uh, fee and an easy form, but most states require that you do it every year or every couple of years. And it's one of those things that a lot of nonprofits aren't aware of and um, they get stung on it later. So that's another one to research with your attorney general. There are some limited SOX uh, obligations, which was a federal law, the Sarbanes-Oxley law, as you might remember, came out of a lot of the Enron and other scandals, uh, I guess probably a decade ago now. And nonprofits actually are obligated to follow a whistleblower law and a document retention. So it's very important that you set up some sort of whistleblower policy and that um, if requested 
to maintain documents through uh, a legal action, you can't uh, go in and start shredding. Uh, so I, I'm sure none of you have that issue, but um, it is good to know that you're liable for those. And I think they're showing up now on the 990s, so it's a reminder when you have to check those boxes off on whether you have those. Of course, there's all sorts of employment laws because most nonprofits are employers. Um, and so if you have employees, you would fall under all of the standards at local, state, and federal levels. And of course, the biggest one is payroll and understanding the difference between 1099 contractors and W-2 employees, which is a chronic issue across the globe uh, in the U.S., but um, also for nonprofits. So there are always a lot of questions and audit trails around that. And then um, also, of course, uh, equal employment opportunity laws and others that tend to operate at, at both state and federal levels. And then anything else that your nonprofit business is in. So if you're running facilities, if you're serving certain at-risk populations, if you're um, in the food service business, um, you know, all of those regulations that are specific to your industry would come into contact. So what we recommend is that boards every, you know, three to five years really go through a comprehensive kind of compliance audit at the board level so they understand what uh, major areas in the laws and legal um, compliance as well as tax exemption that they are on the hook for and that there's some sort of assessment of where they stand. Are they doing the filings? Are they having those risk management conversations? Are they following the protocols and procedures? So it's probably not something you need to do annually, but certainly every three to five years, we really recommend a comprehensive audit so that you really understand what the baseline is. So I'm going to stop there and uh, see if there are any quick questions before we move on to some of what I would say the negotiables are. Yep. Thanks, Emily. We got four questions that came in in this section. Um, the first one, you talked about compensation and um, the IRS review for larger organizations. Um, one question here was, have you had any experience or suggestion on smaller organizations and how they get compensation data to figure out if they're competitive in the marketplace mm -hmm. um, in, in rural or, or smaller areas where maybe they don't have a lot of data? Right. Well, I think the... Um, there are uh, kind of three main sources of data generally in a compensation review. Um, one is published surveys, and so to the extent you can look at the chronicle of philanthropy, which tends to skew somewhat to higher organizations, uh, but also a lot of the uh, state nonprofit associations will do comp surveys, and there are some other national ones um, in trade associations or um, other service organizations. So I'd say do a scan to see what published surveys are out there and see if you can pull relevant data from them. Uh, okay. The challenge with those is that it's limited to the people who reply and um, it's always a couple of years old because they're pulling from last year and then it takes a year to publish it. So you've always got to think about elevating those at 3% a year or something to stay consistent. Um, another source is GuideStar, um, which uh, has a similar dating issue, but you can go onto GuideStar and look for your, your zip code, the type of mission, your budget size, and pull a national or a regionalized sample. So if you're in a rural area and you don't have a lot of data points, you might be able to look at other rural areas, other rural zip codes. Um, for organizations of your budget size. So it might not be exact to your county, but it would be more relevant than looking at the biggest city that's next. Um, okay. And that's, there's a lot of rigorous data there. And then the other is just calling around and getting real-time data from your peers. And what we found is that if you're willing to make the data anonymous and to share the data so that if you develop a deck and you say, here are the you know, 20 direct service providers in our county or region, and you just list them as A through whatever 20 letters is, T or something, um, and you share the data, um, they want it also, and they're willing to participate. But there's generally they want some um, offer of confidentiality. So those are all tools depending on how deep in you want to go for um, benchmarking. 
Great, thank you. I'm going to just pick one other quick question here in the interest of time. We've got four here, but we'll try and get all questions answered at the end if we have time, or we'll follow up with you afterwards as well. But um, one other question came in around, do you have any recommendations for good online sites for templates for the legal documents for an organization? You talked about the whistleblower, um, conflict of interest, Anything you favor in getting... Yeah, I would go to board, board Source is a good um, option, boardsource.org, and they're in the resources in the back. But they offer a lot of templates and policies. And another one I would go to is uh, NOLO, NOLO Press. And I don't know if it's nolo.com or nolo.org, but it's N-O-L-O. -O. And they have um, federal information as well as state-specific and nonprofit-specific. So that tends to be a really good affordable resource for those kinds of templates. Great. OK. I think we are going so, to, um, oh, go ahead. Should we, yeah, I was just going to say, should we move on to the next section? Yep, I think we should. And Dennis, did you want to do a poll here, or should we move on? Um, I think um, we'll move on, just in the interest of time. we got about 12.30 okay. right now, so we'll move on. Great. Okay, so I'm going to um, go through some trends, and there are a lot of them. So I'm not, you know, each one of these probably could be a webinar, um, but we don't have that much time. So I'm just going to move through these pretty quickly. You'll probably recognize a lot of them. Um, the first one I elevated because it's the one we hear about the most, and that's increased fundraising demands um, on organizations and on boards. And I think that's... Um, just part of the environment in which we're operating. Uh, as more and more nonprofits incorporate, there's uh, increased activity, increased um, desire for fundraising. The funding uh, environment, as we've seen over the last few years, is very dynamic on all sides. And so more and more boards are proactively or being asked by their staff to engage in fundraising. Um, there's also uh, a lot of government funding shifts at local, state, and national levels. Um, and for some, it's going down. For some, it's very, nobody knows whether it will or not, and it's very last minute coming from the state of California. I can tell you there's a lot of uncertainty until that um, budget passes, sometimes retroactive to the time it started. So even if the funding ends up to be stable, it's highly uncertain. And there's certainly government funding growth in other areas. Um, and so those that are in areas of interest of the government, um, they have really benefited, actually, from increased government spending. We're seeing a lot more CEO and executive director transitions. There had been a big buildup demographically. We're expecting a huge wave of boomers who started and have been running on profits to retire, and that was squelched a bit by the economy, um, but now we're really seeing that break open and a lot more turnover, particularly of either founders or long-term executive directors, and that has uh, implications really throughout the whole ecosystem of the organization and the community. We're also seeing a lot more discussion among boards um, on mergers and thinking about partnering. Um, sharing back office services, sharing a finance director, sharing an HR staff, outsourcing some of those things. So really a whole continuum of engaging other organizations and vendors in getting the business side done in particular, but also the um, program side. Uh, and some of these are coming from the organizations proactively, and we have seen instances where the county comes to an organization and says, we need you to save this other organization, and we need you to take them on. So they're really being, being um, requested, uh, advocated by a county. So it's good to be prepared for those conversations, even if your board is not actively seeking. Um, funder interest in collective impact, this is one of the new buzzwords for 2012-2013, which really is about working together as an ecosystem in your community or across um, a particular mission area, and also more network work, so reaching well beyond your own mission and operations to understand if you're working on poverty, who else is working on that, what are the different angles, what could you be doing together, and I think there are funding opportunities there if you can think about developing a cohort of your peers to go after moving the needle in a bigger way. 
um, but they're complicated and messy. So it really requires some governance thinking before you move into them. Um, there's a, you're probably all experiencing this, a real increased expectation for proving results. Um, what did you do with that money? How many people did you serve? How do you know they're more literate? How do you know they're going to escape homelessness, et cetera? And also this idea of direct philanthropy. So um, the kivas of the world, the crowdsourcing, um, raising money on crowdfunding sites. Um, this idea that um, I have some money and I want to give it directly to an organization or directly to constituents. And this is a big shift away from the uh, federated fundraising models, the workplace giving models, the United Ways, community foundations, federations are all struggling with this desire to have a direct connection to the constituents. So it's something to think about um, providing to donors. You all know about social media, um, the perceptions move faster and farther, whether they're positive or negative. So it's a new tool, but also a new area of risk management for boards. Lots of demands for transparency, sharing financials, sharing compensation data, sharing program metrics, sharing um, efficacy, proving results. Um, and again, there have been, this generally comes more from the press than from the IRS or um, your attorney general. It, it tends to be press driven. Uh, so it's good to think about your stance on that as a board and how you react to uh, questions or requests for more transparency. There's a big trend as it uh, has been developing over the past decade or so around ranking. Um, and it's everything from Charity Navigator to uh, GuideStar now has a kind of ranking, uh, I forget what they call it, great nonprofits or something. But there are multiple others, um, better business bureaus and others that are uh, putting nonprofits under increased scrutiny and doing it in a very public way. So it's good to know how you rank on those and what your position is and how to think about elevating those rankings. For, for better or for worse, it's, it's the environment we're in. There are still lots of open board seats. Um, and I know there's always a question about whether it's better to have a larger board or a smaller board. I'm actually going to get into that in a minute. But uh, regardless of the size of the board, most boards have open seats. So what that means is that there's opportunity to leverage new talent, new resources on the board. Um, it also means typically there's a high degree of competition for those that already have experience as board members. And we need to think about bringing others in who um, may not be on that kind of traditional hit list for board members. Ongoing concerns about the diversity of boards. The bottom line is they're not diverse. Um, and uh, also about community representation and this feeling of separation of the board from the communities they're actually serving. And we're getting more and more questions of our clients from funders about these two topics and also going back to what the press talks about and what winds up on social media and the ranking sites, this is continuing to elevate and we have not as a sector done a good job here overall. There's also an increasing need to get involved in policy and advocacy work for nonprofits that have never had to do that. They've never moved in those circles. It's never been part of their agenda, but they're finding particularly with government funding shifts that they feel they need to be at the table by themselves or as part of a collective. And that's opening up all sorts of questions and education for boards about how they move into that space and not lose their tax exemption or um, trigger a reaction from their donors and how they really navigate the advocacy space. In the resources slide, I've, I've offered a couple of resources, but there's plenty of places to get board education on that. And then Overall, again, no surprise, we're just in uh, a new um, kind of dynamic in the world and the world of business and the world of nonprofits where change is constant. It, you know, this is not, this is not a, a bubble. It's not kind of a trend that's going to go away. It's the pace of our lives and the pace of business. And so we need to think about how governance changes in order to be more nimble and adaptable and be able to 
listen to and respond to the environment in real time. So I know that there have been some questions coming up, so maybe I'll um, go through some of these. Um, let's see, there's an interesting one here about mergers between nonprofits and for-profits. Are you seeing this anywhere? Um, I, I am seeing that, actually. I would not say it is the norm, and it is not a lot of volume, but uh, I actually have seen, and in some cases been peripherally involved in mergers between nonprofits and for-profits. Um, it is possible. It requires a lot of navigating on the governance and particularly the IRS compliance side. Um, it is easier for a for-profit to merge into a nonprofit than the other way around, um, but it is possible. Um, so I think that's kind of an area of specialty you could look at, but it, it certainly has happened and in some cases has really benefited the community. Uh, another one is about um, the uh, term limits, and uh, we've seen a lot of conversations around terms. Uh, I don't, it'd be interesting to look at the board source governance index, because I don't recall. I think that most of their, in their research, most boards do have terms, um, but I don't know if they have term limits, so I'd have to, go back and, and research that. Um, we have seen an increased use of terms in our clients. Um, and I think they go into it with the intention of wanting to make sure that the board turns over, that it doesn't get stuck, that if there's someone who's underperforming, there's kind of a natural excuse to call the question of whether they really need to stay engaged but to actively be continuing to build the pipeline of talent instead of getting um, uh, stale and be continuing to bring in new perspectives. So it can help uh, that um, goal of staying more present to the community, bringing in new perspectives, being more nimble. If you're just using it to try to kick off dead weight, I think there are other things you need to be dealing with about why you have dead weight and the culture of the board and the expectations of the board. So it, it can be used as a blunt instrument, which I don't think is the right reason to be using term limits. So Jess, I'm going to stop there. Did you see any other questions that you wanted to elevate? I guess there's one here, um, you've talked about boards um, becoming more diverse and, and uh, inclusion, and there's a question here about approaches that you've used or you've seen success with to help boards move towards greater diversity and inclusion. Mm. Yeah, so I, this, um, there's actually quite a bit of um, thinking on this going on in the sector, so I do encourage you to, to look at board source or your local nonprofit provider, Compass Point. Um, out here, but they really have national conversations, has been talking a lot about that. Uh, I think the bottom line is you cannot continue to do what you've tried and think somehow the result is going to be different. Um, so it really requires moving beyond the kind of who do you know in your Rolodex and actively saying what skills, networks, representation, talent are we looking for and what diverse segments do we need to represent on our board and proactively going out. We almost compare it to an executive search. You know, if you're going to go look for a CEO, you map out what you need, and then you think, where does that person hang out? Where would I find that person? And then you actively recruit to go after them. And I think it's the same with boards, uh, and particularly diversity, because the human uh, proclivity is to hang out with people who are similar to you. That's just a behavioral trait we have as humans. And so if you've got a board that's not diverse, chances are your network is not diverse. So you need to be proactively saying, uh, who's running the Chamber of Commerce and how can we think with them about bringing that community onto our board? Whether it's a, an ethnic community, a cultural community, a, bringing more rural presence, diversity could mean a lot of things, bringing more men, more women, more corporate, et cetera. Um, but you have to think about where they hang out and go and try to partner with them because it's probably in their best interest to have their community represented on your board. And typically it helps to have a cohort. So it's one thing to bring one diverse member on and it feels you know, like 
12 angry men, right, where you're <laughs> trying to kind of shift the balance. But if you bring on a cohort of three or four at a time, it doesn't feel like tokenism. And it starts to shift the dynamic of how the board perceives the benefits of diversity. So bringing in a cohort is also helpful. Great, thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Yeah. So in response to some of those um, field trends, I, I also want to just elevate a view of the social trends, which um, again, probably won't be a surprise to you, but I'll just elevate a few of these. Uh, the workforce has changed and it has impacted the availability to serve on boards. So there is an increased trend toward having dual income families. There are fewer kind of professional volunteers. Um, people move across borders and so they don't tend to stay in a community for a long period of time. They tend to be dropping in and out of communities every few years and also moving internationally and back. So it's just a more um, kind of transient community of professionals to serve on your boards. Um, sometimes they are moving jobs quite rapidly and so if you've got somebody who's got a great connection to the local bank, uh, the chances that they're going to keep that connection to the local bank for 20 years is pretty slim. So this has um, increased the need to continue to develop relationships across multiple stakeholders with multiple um, entities because you can't rely on one person to hold that relationship for any period of time. And it also means that as they're moving from job to job or they're doing a startup or they're joining um, a smaller firm, that their ability to give may change over time. So there's just less stability in the whole um, makeup of the board and their ability to give time to leverage their connections and to leverage their own um, dollars. So they may have more time for expertise if they're um, shifting jobs, but other pieces may change. We've already talked about diversity. Um, this is a, a study that I pulled um, uh, just this week that whites will become the minority by 2043. And uh, so it is increasingly important to make sure that boards are representative of our actual community. There's also a very interesting trend going on, uh, another study uh, that $59 trillion will transfer in wealth uh, in the next few decades. And it could mean, and we're certainly seeing it out here in Silicon Valley, that the um, professional volunteer actually increases. Um, as, as you know, there have been a lot of um, companies that have gone public in Silicon Valley, there's a great deal of wealth out here. And we are actually seeing an increase in people who are leaving the workforce and being professional board members, serving on multiple boards, leveraging their talents. So I think as wealth transfer increases, um, there may actually be an increase in that professional volunteer over time, but certainly in um, private foundations and philanthropy. Uh, but I think it'll look different as the next generation takes it over. And then increased familiarity with more project-based and virtual work. So we're definitely seeing less interest in joining a board for nine years and serving on the same standing committee for nine years. Because people are more transient, they're used to project work instead of um, more traditional uh, kind of corporate initiatives that or functional functional initiatives that don't change over time, that the work of the board needs to change as well toward more task-oriented, discrete, something that they feel they can accomplish, something they can commit to for a certain period of time. So less kind of standing long-term work and a lot more projects that help move the needle and give them immediate feedback that they are, um, are really having an impact. Okay, so so what we're seeing, you're probably seeing a lot of similar ones and, and we can elevate some more of what you're seeing in a few minutes here. But as a result, what are boards doing? And what I'd like to emphasize here is that uh, there are the non-negotiables and you really can't experiment with those. You've got to know what you're on the hook for. You've got to know what standards you need to be meeting. You don't want to um, jeopardize your tax exemption or your uh, corporate status with your attorney general. But 
once you've got that baseline down, um, there is no right answer. I find in the sector there's a lot of prescriptive, you know, do these 10 steps, form these six committees, and I really think that our world has changed. You need to think about how do we meet these minimum compliance standards, and then you need to think about where are we trying to take this organization, how does this mission need to move itself and change our community in the next 10 years. Then back into what sort of governance do we need to get us there. And I really encourage our clients to try new things and to not get stuck following all the templates and prescriptive models that have been out there because I, I don't think they're working for most organizations. So uh, we always say if you've seen one board, you've seen one board. It's like snowflakes. They all have kind of their own identity. And I actually encourage boards to embrace this, to say, you know, just because our two peers have fundraising committees, we don't necessarily have to have a fundraising committee. What do we need? Uh, and it might look different than having a standing fundraising committee. It might have a different shape. We might have a major donor committee, an events committee, and a next generation philanthropist committee. Um, and maybe they're task forces instead of committees. So just embrace the fact that all boards need to be different. You have unique missions, unique cultures, unique um, stage of development, and move into that space so that you can really design a board that works for you and open yourself up to trying some new things. So here are some of the structural experiments. Um, and again, you've probably, probably seen a lot of these. As I said, a lot fewer standing committees, more task forces, um, less on kind of marketing, fundraising, and more on a strategic priority of the organization, like we'd like to diversify our revenue streams. That probably will embrace a lot of different uh, skills and functional areas. Um, much uh, greater use of governance committees as opposed to nominating committees, um, they tend to, to be in place over the course uh, of a year, um, a kind of a standing committee, and they're focused more on education, engagement, pipeline development. So it's really an ongoing kind of lifeblood for the organization. A lot less complex bylaws, putting a lot more work into policies that are more flexible. Um, there were a lot of questions about the size of the board, and we're definitely seeing a trend to moving toward a much smaller kind of core board, but a lot more councils, advisory councils, task forces, initiative leaders who are not necessarily showing up and voting and on the hook with the Attorney General, but it's a way to leverage talent in a much more nimble way. So there still are those boards that are 50 and 75, but we're definitely seeing among our client base that they just aren't getting them to the table, they're not engaged, it's a little too, you know, all things to all people. So a much smaller, like five to seven governing board, and then a lot more hubs and nodes around them to help get the work done in a more flexible way. Um, and you can see you know, some of these other trends, uh, non-board members on committees and task forces getting more youth involved. Um, there are lots of interesting dynamics about whether or not the CEO is a voting member, and it's going up and down, uh, but that's kind of an interesting conversation going on in the sector. The same with staff presence. Some are taking it off, some are increasing it. So it really has to do with what you're trying to achieve and your own culture and goals. There's no right answer there. And then interesting um, developments around moves into more policy and advocacy, developing C4s in addition to C3s, which allows for more lobbying work, and also creating LLCs or other corporate entities to drive revenue back to the nonprofits. So I, I think the key takeaway here is that um, lots of people are trying lots of different things. You shouldn't feel constrained by um, trying to box yourself into what other people are. Just open it up to some experimentation. These are some of the tools and formats, more use of consent agendas, so there's more discussion time. People are doing a lot more small group breakouts during board meetings, which gets them engaged in conversations. A lot more kind of what's happening in the field conversations and a lot less reporting out. Definitely more virtual meetings and use of online tools. Um, ethics 
uh, statements. I mentioned crowdfunding and social media. And then definitely more dedicated time for board education and whatever that means for your board. But boards typically tend to be engaged when they feel they know the content, they're able to leverage their expertise, and they can discuss topics that really are at the governance level around shifts in paradigm, shifts in thinking, how you position yourself to impact the community more, and that generally requires a different sort of board meeting with different kinds of conversations, breakout groups, um, presenters, and uh, more board education. All right, so we are moving into the final few minutes, and uh, Dennis, I think it's a good time to maybe elevate some other questions that came in, or if anybody has some other examples to share, that would be great too. Yeah, we got a couple of questions here. One is, um, you know, everyone tells us, I'm assuming us as the nonprofit community, that boards should be fundraisers. Is that true in your opinion, and is that the only way to raise money? I have an opinion, but I'd love to hear yours. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think an organization needs to develop its uh, fund development priorities and determine the board's role in that. Um, and I, again, I'm seeing uh, as a national trend, there is a great deal of pressure on boards to turn into fundraising boards, but not everybody wants to be or can be a fundraiser. And so I, I think from what we're seeing among our client base is that they're letting go of that idea that every board member needs to be a fundraiser because they may be bringing other talents to the table or representation in the community or something else, but there's definitely a much bigger focus in developing fundraising bodies. So again, fundraising councils, events councils, individual donor councils, corporate councils, and trying to um, give those who are interested a much more discreet piece of work instead of go raise a lot of money. So you find people that really move well in the corporate community and put them on a corporate council. And those that really love to leverage their social networks through social engagements, they can throw house parties. So it's a lot more customized to the people and talents you've got and moving it well beyond the board instead of feeling like you've only got that, got that body to work with. So it can be more complicated, but I think by focusing only on the board, we're not leveraging the other folks in our community who are engaged in our mission. And you may be disempowering the board members who really want to think strategically and move your mission forward, but feel like they're getting browbeaten around fundraising. So I think we need to try some new things there. OK. One other question here, um, comment around uh, heard national organizations using executive search firms for board members. You know, is that common? Um, are there trends in compensation for board members of nonprofits? Is that strictly healthcare, hospitals, or for-profits? Mm. Do you see any broader trends in either of those areas? Yeah, um, the the number of nonprofits who pay their board members is still almost infinitesimally small. Um, you hear about it because they tend to be big and they tend to get into the press. But typically, it is a small cohort of private foundations and then the really large, complicated organizations. But even of that kind of 1% of the sector, it's a small portion that is compensating. I don't think th there's going to be an increase in compensation. I think those that do it, um, whether there are good reasons for it or not, in this environment are going to come under increased scrutiny and you have to think about whether you really want to attract that attention. So there may be good reasons, but there are pretty significant trade-offs. Um, I have seen some increase in paying search services for board seats. Uh, it's a very normalized service in the for-profit sector to have recruiters place um, for-profit boards, but typically those members are compensated. Um, so it feels like a more natural vendor service. Uh, I think it's still pretty rare for um, search firms to be engaged, but I've seen more consultants that are doing broader governance work take on a role in helping to position and help do outreach to their community. So I've seen it in a little bit softer kind of part of a broader governance uh, transition or overhaul or improvement. 
rather than search firms. Again, you know, that tends to be a very tiny portion of just the largest nonprofits. Okay. I think we got time for one last question here. There was a question that came in a little bit a while ago, and it um, touched on two points that you made earlier. And um, one was the strong push for nonprofit sustainability to really consider new revenue streams. And then, how does that balance or fit with the audit concerns of UBIT? Well, you have to you have to model it out. I think a lot of organizations are thinking about them as business lines and they include UBIT as part of the P&L, so they understand whether they can actually generate a profit from that revenue stream uh, if they're subject to UBIT, or they decide they're just not even going to open that risk and they just include it from the start. Um, and others, as I said, are starting LLCs, so it's really a separate entity. Um, it doesn't get confused with their tax-exempt status, but then the profits from the LLC go back to the nonprofit, and there's basically an MOU between the two companies. Um, so I think organizations are just assuming they're going to have to build it right along into their um, financial modeling when they um, when they come up with those revenue ideas. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Emily, and and please join me, everyone, in thanking Emily for today's content and BMO Harris um, Bank for their support. Um, the governance presentation she shared today was so valuable, and as with all of our webinars, and there were some questions that were coming in. This is being recorded. We will have the uh, playback available from our website probably within the next 24 hours or so. We would encourage all participants to review our website at forwardci.org for more information on how Forward Community Investments might help your organization. And on a flash, uh, final note here, when you close your browser from the session, you will be directed um, to a very concise questionnaire that um, will ask you for some feedback on today's session. So if you take a few minutes to complete that to help us continue to improve the effectiveness of these offerings, we would very much appreciate it. And then before we close it down, um, I do want to note that uh, next month in our series on June 18th, actually Forward Community Investments um, and jointly partnered with Vista Global Coaching and Consulting, Mary Stella Tello will be with us. We'll be talking about strategic decision making and is your organization built to last? So. Thank you much for uh, participating today, for dialing in. Thanks again to Emily for her um, experience and her um, knowledge shared. And enjoy your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.